Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Welcome to Cranny Baptist Church. It's lovely to have you with us. My grandma used to have a funny little saying, which I'm sure you've heard. She used to say, all good things come to those who wait. And she normally used to lecture me with this when I was being incredibly impatient. As many of you know, our initial plan was to have this event uh, about a month ago. It wasn't possible. So we are really delighted that you've remembered uh, and that you're here this evening. I'm personally oh, delighted to uh, welcome our very special guest this evening. Uh, first time we've met, although I've been very familiar with him because of this DVD. Do you all know what a DVD is? Because they've gone out of fashion a little bit, haven't they? Uh, I used to do these small groups with students using this. Uh, Professor Richard Dawkins and Professor John Lennox has Science Buried God. It's about 80 minutes long, and we used to divvy it up into four parts and watch about 20 minutes and then have discussions on it. It was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant tool. Uh, John is a Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Oxford University, a man of science, a man of faith, often things that people think are incompatible uh, and he draws them together, which I hope you're going to see this evening. Uh, Richard Bergonon's going to be interviewing him. He's a church leader here, uh, runs a mission called Word One to One, uh, and he's going to pose the questions. And I've seen what some of them are on science and scripture, on the supernatural, on suffering, and a whole load of other things that don't begin with S. Um, so hopefully it's going to be a great evening. Brief housekeeping. Uh, in the case of a fire, and you'll know if there's a fire, because it kind of gets hot and smoky, uh, but we've got exits at the front here and at the back there. Uh, if you need the toilet, you can find some out here and out there. End of housekeeping. Lovely to have you with us. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Richard and John Lennox. Well, it's lovely to see you all. Thank you all for coming back a month later. John, it's great to see you in health. So we know you had that awful accident a month ago, but it's great that you've joined us. Now, let me, let me go through the list of who you are. Uh, John Lennox, Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University, who also happens to hold an MA and a PhD in maths from Cambridge University. Um, oh, as well as a DSC from Cardiff University, while holding an MA in Bioethics from Surrey University. Is that, is that you? I believe so. It is you, right. Well, you are an internationally renowned speaker and broadcaster on the interface of science, philosophy and religion, your website says, and a regular teacher at many academic institutions as well as being a senior fellow with the Trinity Forum. You're an author of a series of books exploring the relationship between science and Christianity. So, obviously... You've come to Cranley, the pinnacle <laughs> of all things academia. Welcome. Thank you. And all thank joking you. apart, um, it is a huge thank you because we know that you are buried in invitations and we know that this is actually one of your first since lockdown. So we're particularly pleased to see you and very grateful. And can I just put everyone's mind at rest before we start? After a lot of thought, I've decided not to ask you questions on algebra. Is that okay? That's okay. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It's a, a special pleasure to be back in Cranley. I've known Richard for, what, 40 years or yeah. something? And I've been in this church before. But it was specially moving for me this evening to see the sign up outside saying, pray for Ukraine. And I understand that there may well be quite a few people from Ukraine here. And if they will forgive me, I will just greet them in Russian. And I've been in Ukraine about 40 times uh, in the early 90s. And so it's special for me to realize that this church is participating in helping Ukrainians in this way. Absolutely wonderful. So that, for me, is a high point, simply to be here and to already speak a little bit of my nearest approximation to that language. I should tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I hold the world record for the maximum number of mistakes you can make in Russian in 50 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> Now, John, you grew up in, in a Christian family in Northern Ireland. 
Does that mean you've always believed in God? Are, are you a Christian because your parents were a Christians? Tell us about your background. My background was unusual in the sense that Northern Ireland has a sad and partly deserved reputation for sectarianism. And my parents were committed Christians, but very unusually for those days, they were not sectarian. Now, let me explain that to you, because Dad ran a store in the center of town, and I can never remember how many employees he had, maybe 30 or 40 at most. But he insisted on employing equally so far as he could from the divided religious community, in other words, Protestants and Catholics. And that cost him bombs. My brother was nearly killed by a terrorist bomb. And I once said to him, Dad, why do you do it? And he said, look, he said, son, I read in Genesis that all men and women, quite irrespective of their worldview or their religion, are made in the image of God. And I intend to treat them like that. Now, that left a very deep impression with me. Then in my own limited way, I've tried to do the same. Because it seems to me to be the only way to have a sensible dialogue with people, to respect them and to value them, even if you disagree with them deeply. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that because of that and because of the way they lived, their Christianity was credible in the sense that they lived it. It wasn't just a matter of going to church. It was absolutely real. And that expressed itself in another very important way. They loved me enough to allow me to make up my own mind and didn't force a religion down my throat. And that happened a great deal in my country so that Many of my contemporaries, when they left Northern Ireland, they left all vestiges of Christianity behind because it had never been their own personal conviction. Whereas my mum and dad, they give me evidence, they taught me to think about it. And one of the things they taught me in answer to your question directly was that we are all made as creatures of God in the image of God, and that gives us infinite value and dignity to start with. But then I learned very early on that one of the most marvelous things about God is that he gives us the opportunity to take a step further and to become related to him in a special way. And so I had to become a Christian. And that is a strange idea to many people. So certainly I'm not a Christian because of Irish genetics, although I must confess that in Cambridge, I was constantly accused of that. And people would say to me, well, of course, you know, you're Christian because uh, you're Irish and all Irish believe in God and they fight about it. And uh, it's an interesting argument, but it doesn't work uh, really very well, as I later discovered. It's a Freudian argument. And uh, of course, the same exactly applies to atheism as well. Uh, there's a brilliant German psychiatrist, um, Manfred Lutz, and he's written a marvelous book, which I don't think's yet in English. It's called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten, A Brief History of the Great One. And he said, you know, if there isn't a God, then that argument is wonderful. Freud's argument works, that it's just a wish fulfillment coming maybe from your parents or from yourself or from your environment. If there isn't a God, Freud's argument explains brilliantly religion. But of course, if there is a God, then the very same argument will explain to you why people, atheism is a wish fulfillment, uh, the desire not to have anything to do with God. Uh, and so as to whether God exists or not, Freud won't help you at all. And it's that kind of thing that uh, has motivated my life in trying to unpack why people believe what they do. And I, ever since I was in Northern Ireland, I wanted to know what the truth was. And I think the final point I'd make, Richard, is my parents conveyed to me that it wasn't that they found Christianity helpful, but that they believed it was true. And at the moral level, and that's what I met first, 
I can remember my father apologizing to me and my brother because he disciplined us so hard. And we were amazed. What's he apologizing for? And then the penny dropped. I realized that he believed there was a standard above him to which he felt he should subscribe. And so that conveyed to me a very important thing that morality is not just uh, relativistic, but there is a higher sense of morality. And again, that communicated to me the living uh, reality of his faith in God. So you were a Christian by the time you go off to study mathematics at Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. What did the time at university do? Did that dent your faith? Did it strengthen your faith? Tell us about that time. Well, there were many attempts to dent my faith, but, you know, that argument, you're Irish and therefore you're a believer, that really dug into me like a, like a worm. And I was challenged very early on, I think it was the first week at Cambridge, about this. And it suddenly occurred to me what I needed to do. Because in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, I hadn't really met any serious agnostics or atheists. There were Protestant atheists and Catholic atheists, but there were no serious atheists, or not many that I'd met. So I determined to get to know and befriend, and I would emphasize that, really befriend them, get to know them, people that did not share my background or my worldview. And instead of pushing what I believed onto them, listening to them, finding out why they believed what they did, what their value system was, and that I've been doing all my life, even with people like Richard Dawkins that you heard about earlier. And, and that was hugely important. And I, one particular person who was the most brilliant mathematician, much brighter than me in our year, he'd never been to church, and he, he told me later he'd been a kind of agnostic. So we started to talk for two years. And he kept asking me, what's the evidence on which you base your faith in God? And we discussed it and discussed it and discussed it. Until one day in lectures, he wasn't really listening. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, you know, last night I knelt down in my room in college and I became a Christian. And he still is a very strong one, a top professor of mathematical logic in this country. Retired now, of course, as I am. But... What was very interesting about that was I learned that people can change their worldview. It's not a matter of being born like this and you're ever like that. And that was hugely important on the basis of evidence and discussion and friendship above all. People can come to change their worldview. Now, I never knew that experience in a sense. I always, if you'd asked me as a child, did I believe Christianity was true? I would have said yes, even though I also knew I had to take the step of becoming a Christian, which I did. So I needed people. I needed to see that. And I needed mentors to help me to understand what it is like to come from a different perspective. And it's there that particularly C.S. Lewis helped me a great deal. So you knew C.S. Lewis? No, I didn't know him, but I heard him. I'm quite old, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, and it was last century sometime. And I heard C.S. Lewis's very last lectures in Cambridge. And uh, we'll remember that. But it, it, it wasn't his lectures on the poetry of John Donne that influenced me as much as his remarkable clarity of mind and his understanding he wasn't a scientist, he was an English literary expert, but he understood story and he understood the philosophy of science enough to really irritate still today many scientists because he sees through the poverty of the reductionist, materialistic, naturalistic worldview that dominates much of the academy today. And so I found that enormously helpful and still do, of course. If I'm getting a bit proud uh, of my writing and my books, I read a bit of Lewis and I feel very small. He was <laughs> such a, a writing genius. Right, so let's jump forward to today. Here you are, a globally renowned mathematics professor, and the internet is full of your debates with the likes of Hitchens and Dawkins 
and others. Um, are you a lone voice in, in believing that science has not buried God and you, you believe in the God of the Bible? I'm not. You mean a lone voice in the academy? In, ac in not, academia. Not at all. Uh, in my own university at Oxford, you'd be quite surprised at the number of heads of institutes and departments who are keen Christians. I just a week ago listened to a brilliant lecture by one of the world's leading experts in artificial intelligence, Professor Rosalind Pickard of MIT, who is a Christian. And this was a public lecture in a secular context. And one of the responders to her talk was one of the top electrical engineers in the world, a professor at Oxford, Lionel Tarasenko, originally, I think, from Ukraine, and a Christian. And I could go around the faculties and name lots of people. There, there's quite a number of them, but the media don't give that impression. Now, I'm not claiming that everybody's there, but certainly I do not feel that I'm a lone voice at all. And there's an upcoming generation of young academics who, in, in various fields, and I'm glad to say not only the sciences but the humanities, who have a very strong, intelligent Christian commitment and are able to articulate it into the present culture. Well, John, I've done my homework, so I've looked up some of the opposition that you face. Yes. So let me quote from some of them. Let's start with the moral philosopher Peter Singer. He's on record as saying, we don't need a God to explain the universe. Then let's go to Stephen Hawkins. You don't need a God to create it. The universe is the ultimate free lunch. And he went on to say, because there is such a law as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And then Stephen Weinberg, the Nobel laureate in physics, he said, I do indeed think that we are winners in a cosmic lottery. Now, I know you've written a book on it, but would you please summarize your view for us as to why those views are wrong and how they compare with the biblical picture of creation that you believe in? Just a small question, but off you go. <laughs> <laughs> They're all extremely interesting people. I, I regret very much that a planned debate with Stephen Weinberg, who's dead now, I think, in the University of Austin, where he was. It was all organized, but it didn't happen. I would have been, uh, liked to uh, speak with him, but I did have a very interesting debate with Peter Singer and, of course, with Richard Dawkins, but never with Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking was a genius. I, I remember him just at the beginning of his motor neuron disease when he was going around Cambridge on a stick and so on. But <clears throat> their notions of the origin of the universe, God isn't necessary is one approach. God doesn't exist is the other approach. Or if he's not necessary, he might as well not exist. So you've got a mixture of those things. What disturbs me, actually, is the nature of the arguments they use. Now, actually, you've quoted one that really popped out when I was given a, a preview of Stephen Hawking's book, uh, the one he co-authored with Leonard Mladenov, called The Grand Design. And uh, you quoted the heart of the book, the key argument, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, when I first read that, I stopped and I said, come again, because there is a law such as gravity, because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But that's a flat contradiction, logically. And I thought this is very strange for a man of his intellect, a brilliant mathematical physicist. But then I probed a bit further the universe will create itself. Now, I understand ordinary language. If I say to you, X creates Y, roughly speaking, if you've got X, X will produce Y. But what would it mean to say that X creates itself? X creates X. If you've got X, you'll get X. And I've come to the conclusion, frankly, that nonsense remains nonsense, even if a very high-powered scientist writes it. <laughs> And that 
shakes me because if that is the length to which people have to go to dispense with God, then there's something very strange going on. And you get that all over the place. Uh, Lawrence Krauss is another cosmologist. And he talks about nothing. By the way, this idea of the universe from nothing is very popular. So I give lectures on nothing. And it's very interesting talking about nothing, you know. I, I suspect you think that most Irishmen are very good at it. But <laughs> <laughs> you discover when you investigate this nothing, it's not nothing at all. But listen to this for a statement. Now, if a 10-year-old wrote this, what would you think? And this comes from a, an astrophysicist. Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, even if you define it as the absence of something. What? Now, again, here's a man I've debated, Lawrence Krauss, who rejects God, but the reasons. You see, they are faced with the hardest problem in philosophy, very simply stated, why is there something rather than nothing? They haven't answered it. Now, the biblical worldview what does it tell us? That the reason there's something rather than nothing is that there always was someone, an eternal God, who created the universe and holds it in existence. So I say often to my cosmology friends, I said, the universe was created from nothing physical, but it didn't come from nothing. It came from the mind of God. And that accords with all I've ever learned from science. Do you want me to spell that out a bit? Yes, go on. Keep yeah. going. Because it seems to me that the pioneers of science, let's start with a bit of history we probably all know. You start with Galileo, Kepler, Newton, come up, Clark Maxwell, Faraday, all of these people believed in God. And it's clear that their faith in God didn't hinder their science, it was the motor that drove it. Now, that is such a remarkable fact. And it has interested me since childhood when I first came across it, I think with C.S. Lewis actually reading him, that nowadays you get people sitting in Isaac Newton's chair, like Stephen Hawking, and who are using gravity that Newton felt was so beautiful, it was evidence of God, and Stephen Hawking says it's evidence that God doesn't exist at all. It's come full circle. And what fascinates me about that is, I'm a mathematician, and one of the things that always puzzled me from childhood was, how is it that mathematics works? Did you ever think about that? How is it that here's a mathematician and she's thinking up here and she comes up with an equation and it can describe the movement of one of the moons of Jupiter? How does that work? And Einstein was bright enough to see that there was a problem. And he said, you know, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Now you see, if you start from the biblical worldview position, that God spoke, and this universe is the result of a series of speech acts. It's a word-based universe. That makes perfect sense. Mathematics is the most compressed and probably the most accurate language we have. We have our natural languages, and I love those too. But mathematics is perhaps the most precise one. We describe the universe, at least in part, in a language. Now, everywhere we see language, we know that there's a mind behind it. We look at that, Cranley Baptist Church. The moment you see that, now, that was probably made by a machine. It was printed, all kinds of automatic processes. But because those words carry meaning, you know there's a mind behind that. And what amazes me is the most brilliant people in the world, they look at the mathematical describability of the universe. And they don't see 
as Newton saw, and as Faraday saw, and as Clark Maxwell saw, the mind of God behind it. And what will I say to my biology friends who point out that the human genome is 3.4 chemical letters, billion, 3.4 billion letters long, the longest word we've ever discovered. So in mathematics and in our biology, we find these huge words. And the human genome's like a computer program. One letter wrong, and it doesn't work. Whenever we see that, that carries meaning, and it does because it codes for the proteins, we would normally postulate a mind. But when I ask my colleagues, they say, oh, it's just chance and necessity. But they wouldn't say that of the three letters, O, U, R, up there in our vision. They wouldn't say chance and necessity proved that. Why? Because it carries meaning. And all I want to argue for is that we have a fair public discussion and realize what we are being told by some of the leading scientists in the world. Now, I want to say something right here. Albert Einstein said, the scientist is a poor philosopher. And that is what you find when these people go outside their field and start to talk about God and philosophy and science. And it's very interesting that Lord Rees, who's not a believer in God, our astronomer royal, he said of Stephen Hawking's statements about God, he said, you know, I know Stephen. He's worked with Stephen. He said he knows uh, nothing about theology and very little about philosophy, and I wouldn't listen to him on either subject. <laughs> and that was a very open thing to say at that time. So what bothers me intensely, and it's why I do what I do, I try to in a limited way, is at least to show to people, or to try to show, that there is another side to all of this. That what we are being told by people like this, it's, it's not that it simply contradicts the biblical worldview. It doesn't make any coherent sense in itself. It falls down before you even start comparing it with something else. And that's a very different matter. Well, you've answered half my question, so I'm going oh, to come I? back for the other half. Oh, yes. Um, I asked you about how the biblical picture actually works. Now, one of the things that Cranley have done tonight is they've set up a bookstall where they've got in a lot of your books and uh, they've done it at cost price, so nobody's making any money. But I'd like you to please talk about why you wrote Seven Days That Divided the World. Oh, you would. Because um, <laughs> this is one of the books we've got on sale, and it's the beginning according to Genesis and Science. So would you take us back to a view in Genesis which talks about the seven stages at the beginning of the world? Would you take us through why you believe in that, please? Well... And that started at the very beginning, as a famous song once said. <laughs> That's the very good place to start. Do you remember that? <laughs> in the sound of music. Um, the Genesis story has come in for a lot of flack. And I can understand a bit of it. But when we take literature seriously and don't try to force it into a literalistic mold, but really take it seriously, you find a very different story unfolds. But to discuss with you in detail the whole Genesis 1 narrative, which is about 100 words long and is packed full of fascinating information, would take a very long time, which is why I wrote the book, because I get this question a lot. But let me take just one or two points rather than spend the whole evening, which we could now do. First of all, Imagine me at a, a conference of very famous scientists in a country quite a long way from here, discussing uh, the kind of issue we've just been discussing. And I was the token Christian among all these people. They were all mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, and so on and so forth. And I pointed out that wasn't it extremely interesting that... Genesis starts with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I was heckled, I was interrupted. And a very well-known physicist got up, he was very angry. And he said, Professor Lennox, I hope you're joking. Suggesting to us, meaning us scientists, that the Bible has anything to say in the 21st century. 
So that was quite a challenge. And I said to him, I had to say something. I couldn't just ignore it. I said, well, I said, it's interesting, you know, that Genesis states that there was a beginning. And you believe that, I assume, and he did. When did science come to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning? So far as I recall, it was in the 1960s. For centuries, they believed that the universe was eternal. Why? Because they had held on to Aristotle's view. And Aristotle was in about the third century BC. And it was in the 1960s, and I remembered very well, when the evidence started to come in in terms of the expansion of the universe, in terms of the microwave background, and that kind of thing, uh, that gave evidence that things must have started uh, at a point, at a singularity. And that is by far and away the majority view at the moment. And I said, let me just say to you, of course, Genesis is not a scientific textbook. By definition, it was written thousands of years ago. But then, that is very interesting. How did they know that the universe had a beginning? And I said, I want to say something more. If you, in the scientific fraternity, had taken the biblical worldview seriously as a hypothesis and investigated and seen tried to find out whether there was any evidence of a beginning or not, you might have come to the conclusion that there was a beginning much earlier than you did. I think he was quite upset by my answer. <laughs> but that's the point, that Genesis has got it dead right. It's not a textbook of science. Richard said he wasn't going to ask me any questions about algebra. I just don't teach algebra from Genesis or Leviticus, you know. The point is, Scripture says relatively little about what we might call the natural sciences, but it does say something. And the statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, what heavens and what earth is being talked about? The very same heavens and the very same earth that scientists study. So there is an overlap. It's not a large overlap, but it is a very significant overlap. Now, the seven-day question is, is, is much more subtle, and it needs to be looked at in, in a lot more detail. But basically, what you've got, if you ask, what are the things that are emphasized? Well, there's a sequence of what are called days in the text. And God said, let there be light. And God said, and God said, and God said. Now, those are the things that are repeated. If you turn to the New Testament, which comments on this, it's fascinating because the beginning of John's gospel goes like this. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. All things came to be through the Word. So what Genesis is doing is unpacking the idea of a speaking God now, when God speaks, it's not like when I speak. If I sit here and say, let there be light, nothing will happen until somebody pulls the light switch. My speech has not got the power of creating anything, but God's apparently has. So what is being emphasized in Genesis is that this is a word-based universe, which is the exact opposite, by the way, of a universe that created itself from nothing by random unguided processes. The exact opposite. That's the first point. And when I see that, now people argue about these days and the length of them. Just let me say one thing about those because we could spend all evening on it. People say, look, there are 24 hour days of, of one week and so that's nonsensical because it means the earth is very young. But you see, that comes from not understanding the original language. And in Hebrew, it's very interesting. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is in one Hebrew past tense. There are two. And then there's the description of the days, and that is in a second past tense. Now, I thought I'd consult the professors of Hebrew at both Cambridge and Oxford. And you know, they agreed. And uh, that might be an unusual circumstance, but they did agree. 
And they told me that what that means is that the statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, occurred at a period, I quote, an indefinite period before the sequence of speech acts. So what does the Bible say about the age of the earth? Nothing at all. And one of the problems in this whole debate, and it's so sad when Christians fight about it and all the rest of it, that sometimes people are fighting to protect something that doesn't actually hold weight when you look at it more carefully. And people say to me, but they are 24-hour days. And I say, just a minute. Where's the first mention of the word day in Genesis 1? And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Is that a 24-hour day? No, it's not. It's a 12-hour day at the equator. So the first mention of the word is not a 24-hour day. And then at the end, God rested on the seventh day. And there is no phrase, and there was evening and morning, day seven. And right from the time of the early church fathers, they saw that that was an indicator that God's rest from creating has lasted right up until now. So that's a very long day. So I would want to argue, and I do in the book, and you can read it there if you wish, that the word day has four distinct meanings in that short text. Now, that warns me that this is much more sophisticated than you might think. It's rich. And I love literature and love the way it works. So that's just a little taster to indicate that as far as the age of the earth is concerned, well, the contemporary view is, what, 13.7 billion years? I don't find any difficulty with that. That's something we can find out for ourselves. There's evidence for it. And there's nothing, as far as I can see, in Scripture that contradicts it. So that is the way I feel that progress could be made. But we leave that one there. I want to, to push you a little bit further. So I want you to step into the ring with me. In the left-hand corner is you. <laughs> and you're putting your trust in a book which was written thousands of years ago. In the right-hand corner, I'm going to put modern science. So we've got the, the, the discovery of the decoding of the human genome. We've got the discovery of, of nuclear power. We've got sending men to the moon. How is the fight going, John? Do you see there is an erosion or a strengthening in the stand that you have with a book written thousands of years ago? Well, it's a mixed picture, of course. But what I have found over life that all of my investigations, and I trust, I hope I'm speaking honestly when I say, I really take the writings of atheists and other people very seriously indeed. And I read them very thoroughly and I try to understand their arguments because that's the only fair way to proceed. But you see, uh, you have the natural sciences, as you said, one corner in the Bible and the other corner. Now, those are two things that lie in different categories because the Bible is a collection of books, it's a library, it's literature. And the way in which you investigate literature and historical uh, things is not the usual way we're familiar with with dealing with science because in science you're familiar from school with dealing with repeated experimentation, all this kind of thing. Whereas when it comes to history, for example, then you can't repeat things in the lab to see what happens. But then that's true in science as well. You can't repeat the origin of the universe in the lab to see what happens. So you have to make what's called an inference to the best explanation. And I feel that that's a rational approach. It's used in the natural sciences when you're talking about unique events in the past, particularly in astronomy and cosmology. But it's also used with scripture. And you can go to scripture and discover that, for example, Luke, the gospel writer who writes a biography of Jesus and a, an early account of the history of the Christian church, was a brilliant historian by all the ways that we can check uh, the work of historians. Now, I've been interested in that because, as you say, I am a Christian. For me, the Bible is the supreme guide uh, in life. And it also, through it, God speaks to me. So I want to be sure it's reliable. So at the, at the base level of its reliability and authenticity, insofar as such things can be checked, 
I feel it comes through with flying colors. And often people say to me, oh, but it's been copied thousands of times, it's been written thousands of years ago. And I say, just a minute. We possess in Oxford, I think in one of the libraries, a fragment of the Bible that dates to what, about 200 AD. So I'm sitting looking at this at 200 AD. So it's that age. Now, how often was that copied from the original document? Once or twice, maybe? So it comes in two or three steps right up to the present. The idea of it being copied hundreds of times over these thousands of years is a sheer nonsense. It, it just that people haven't thought about it. And I've had a number of instances recently where people have challenged me on this. And I say, well, what books have you read about this? Zero. Because, and it's not their fault, they have no idea that the authenticity and reliability of scripture has been the subject of centuries of research by some of the brightest brains on the planet. Now, as far as the scientists go, the sort of thing they question, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but they may be questioning things like the Bible has a record of the supernatural and miracles and, and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And as scientists, we can't accept that. Is that what you're thinking? Well, of? I was going to say to you next, okay, so you, you've given us the historicity of the Bible, you believe in that, but does that mean that you automatically believe in everything it says? So, for example, <laughs> Hollywood pumps out lots of films about demons and angels and spirits. Do you believe what the Bible says about a spirit life? Is that the kind of thing that you have any problems with when you think of, of what the Bible says in relation to modern day? It's a curious thing, isn't it, that when scientists tell us there's all kinds of life on other planets, everybody says, wonderful. And when the Bible asserts there are beings other than humans, they say nonsense. It's not totally consistent, is it, as a view? And I, I discover that it's not only Christians that believe in the spirit realm. In fact, and this is the problem, I react to all of this by saying, show me your evidence for what you believe. Because you all know there's all kinds of things that are faked, even the news these days, we talk about fake news. And I have no doubt through my contact, particularly with people working in Central Africa and so on, that there is a very dangerous uh, demon world, which is very risky to get entangled with. There's even evidence of it from time to time in this country. And the New Testament claims that when Jesus was here, he dealt with that kind of thing. There is a there are human beings that are part animal and part spirit. And then there are animals, and then above that, apparently, there are spirit beings, there are angels and demons. Now, we might find it difficult, but science doesn't tell us whether these things exist or not. Experience is something that we need to go to, and history, and whether it makes any logical sense. And I found C.S. Lewis very helpful on this kind of thing, because someone once described him as a thoroughgoing supernaturalist. And at the back of this, Richard, the real question to be faced first is, is there a supernatural dimension, or is the natural all that exists? Now, that's where the big battle is in our culture today, at least at the end of it, at which I operate. Well, is to which I would then add, so as you answer this, do you believe that there is a devil? Do you believe that there is a hell? Yeah, I do, because I see the evidence of it. But I do not necessarily subscribe to all the ideas that people have of it. You see, we have to ask ourselves exactly what these things are. And the kind of medieval notion of uh, God uh, stuffing people into hell, so to speak, and all that kind of thing. It's very interesting that Jesus only talked about hell to bigoted religious people that thought they were okay. He didn't talk about it to children or to ordinary folk who were broken in life and desperate for meaning and so on. He warned them as they rejected him 
And, and here's the difficult thing that I find, some people find very difficult to grasp. When Jesus showed his power in healing people, in ridding them of all those evil influences, some of them demonic, some of them psychological, I expect. And they saw him do that. And they said, go, we don't want you. He went. He went. And that tells me something very important, that God loves us enough to honor our choice, even if our choice is to say no to him. And that, of course, is, I believe, the beginning of what the Bible means by hell. It is a deprivation. And you know, as we sit here tonight, all the good things we've got, the food we ate this evening, the cars we came in, the lovely building and all of this, ultimately, if there is a good God, he's provided those things. What would life be like if they were all removed? If we just said to God, go, go, go out of our world, go out of our life. And C.S. Lewis said, in the end, here's the choice. You either say to God, your will be done, or he says to you, your will be done. And that's not hatred. That is actually love, that he will not stampede us into accepting him. That's one of the wonderful things that always meant a great deal to me. I sought my parents that the love of God shone out of them, that it was to be a personal response to God, not force the religion down my throat and you've got to do it. So that's the way I begin to approach that. And the danger with questions like this is because they're loaded, you need to unpack some of the unpalatable sides of them, which aren't in, a, in any case true. Well, I want to keep going. I know you so, do. <laughs> so here's where I want to go. We live in an age which is politically, we're told we're politically correct, or we're very much not politically correct. Uh, we've got concepts of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Are they morally relative? Are, what I, the direction I'm trying to go in is, who anyway can decide what is right and what is wrong? Is sin something that you understand and would talk about now? It is, but I would explain what I meant by it. The idea that all morals are relative is, of course, false, and nobody believes it. You accuse somebody of being a thief and watch to see what they say. Just try it. And they say, no, I'm not a thief. Uh, they believe that they're honest because they believe in honesty and all of this. And the idea of relativity of morals and values, again, can easily be tested. I've never met any sane person who thinks that torturing infants is right. We do have an absolute sense of morality. Now, people may disagree around the world about, say, how many wives you might have. But very few disagree about the question that you shouldn't just have anybody. So that it seems to many people, including myself, and it's one of the reasons I did a degree in bioethics, because I was very interested in facing the question that I find at the heart of our culture today in the legal field, in the academic field, in the business world, in the medical world, or even at a primary school, who said so, miss? What is the authority of your morality? And Michael Burke, uh, some years ago, they did a, a survey about British beliefs, and he said, you know, we're living in the first age where we didn't have a shared common moral base. Now, for centuries, that has been provided by the Judeo-Christian tradition. And Jordan Peterson, whom some of you may listen to, fascinating intellectual Canadian psychologist, uh, came across this verse in Genesis that I mentioned at the beginning. Let us make man and woman in our own image. He said, man, he said, that is the heart of our value system. And we ignore it at our peril. The point is, 
I, along with quite a number of other people, believe that morality is hardwired. And I think there's evidence of that because as you look all around the world, as C.S. Lewis pointed out in his book, The Abolition of Man in 1940, you will find in every tribe, every culture, whether they're atheists, Hindus, Brahmins, Christians, Muslims, pagans, they'll all have a version of the golden rule, do unto others as you would they do unto you. Now, what does that indicate? To me, it indicates that we're made in the image of God as moral beings. And <laughs> in answer to a question about relative or morals relative, I have a friend in Germany, and he says, people usually only think things are relative if they're not important to them. <laughs> and you could think about that. It's absolutely true. Um, you just imagine somebody who believes in the relativity of truth, because that's what it goes uh, back to, going into a postmodern bank. I don't know whether you've got one in Cranley, but he goes into a postmodern bank, and he says to the bank manager, I want a mortgage for £100,000, and you look at my account, but you've only got 10000 in your account, sir. Oh, that's your truth. <laughs> How far do you think you'd get? Because, you see, banks believe in absolute truth. I mean, at least as far as accounts are concerned. I'm not so sure about that uh, at the wider level. Apologies to any bankers here. They're great people. They have lots of friends at banks. But I think the point is well made that when people wave their hands about everything's relative, they're talking about things they don't regard as important. And often those things are their own personal morality. But even that doesn't work. You see, if I go up and hit one of you, and you say, that's not fair, I said, well, I just felt like doing it. That's just the way life is. I think you'll still argue with me that it wasn't right to do it. So I think this, it's another evidence. We talked earlier, let me put it in a bigger, bigger framework. We talked earlier the evidence, some of it, from the natural world, from creation, that points to a mind behind the universe. I believe that inside all of us, that moral dimension that we all are aware of, sometimes very painfully, unfortunately, also points to the fact that this universe is a moral universe. It's not simply a word-based universe, it's a moral universe. And therefore, it seems to me it is very important to, to come back to that. Now, I referred earlier to Professor Rosalind Picard, an artificial intelligence person giving this very prestigious lecture in Oxford. And she was saying, with the developments in our society, the biggest problem is how do we control all these developments morally? And that is part of the question you're raising. If people believe all kinds of different things. How are we going to ensure that the technology we develop doesn't, as both Huxley and Orwell feared, destroy us? And it is destroying some of us. Facebook has destroyed a lot of people, and the metaverse is going to destroy a lot more, unfortunately. Although some of the technology is marvelous, and I use it all the time. And she, I think, stunned the audience because she said we must have controls that value human beings as human beings equally, men and women. She went down a list. And then she said, I believe the solution for it. And she went to the next slide. And there up in the next slide was Imago Dei, the image of God. Now, that was an amazing thing to do to an Oxford academic uh, audience that the imago dei, the idea that we're made in the image of God, is, in her view, the only thing that's going to save us from an absolute catastrophe of moral implosion. John, it's time for a bit of a, a, bit of a pause, because otherwise people are going to be complaining of brain ache. So what I'd like to do, this isn't being sponsored by commercial television, but I'd like to just, as a commercial break, ask you to explain what's on this back table. So first of all, I've got this DVD in my hands. Kevin Sorbo, many will know because he used to be Hercules in the television series. You've gone up against Hercules and done a DVD called Against the Tide. 
Now, can you tell us a little bit about this DVD? Yes. Uh, to cut the story short, Kevin Sorbo uh, is a very well-known actor, particularly to a generation that watched the kind of TV I never watched, because I'd never heard of him. But <laughs> in a film that had a huge box office success in the States called God's Not Dead, he acted an atheist college professor. And he asked all the students in the class at the beginning of the year to fill in a form writing, God is dead. He said, that's the assumption for our philosophy class, God is dead. And one student said he wouldn't write it. He was a Christian student. So the professor said to him cynically, okay, I'll give you the class for the next three weeks and you prove that God is alive. And when I first saw this in the home of a friend in the United States, I was amazed to find this student coming out with my views in my name. He quoted me, you see. And that was the start of it. But in the end of it, um, a friend of mine thought it might be an idea to make a film with Sorbo. And the idea is now he's finished this film, he's back in ordinary life, but he begins to wonder who this person was in Oxford that provided the ammunition for this young student to attack him in the class. So he comes over to Oxford and meets me in the Eagle and Child, where C.S. Lewis used to meet his friends. And we discuss these big questions, going around Oxford and some of the colleges and the various buildings and so on, dealing with some of the issues you've asked me about tonight. And then he says, but look, you're a Christian. And that's more specific than saying you believe in God, some kind of God out there that created the universe. What is it that leads you to make that extra step? And it's a perfectly justifiable question. So I say to him in the film, the best way, one of the ways of dealing with this is to go to where it all started. Why don't we meet in Israel? And the second part of the film is dealing with the specifically Christian evidences uh, surrounding the life the work, the teaching of Christ, his death and his resurrection and so on. So that's what the film's about, but it's full of clips taken from my debates with Richard Dawkins and Hitchens and my experience behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's what it is. I'm not going to say how good or bad it is. That's for you to judge. Well, I've seen it, and it's excellent. And uh, I'm, my fear is we won't have enough copies tonight. Well, you can, can stream it yeah. very inexpensively. It can be streamed. Now, the next one I'm holding in my hand is, is we're very much in an age of artificial intelligence where it's beginning to take off more and more. And you've gone and written a book called 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity. So tell us a bit about why you wrote that. <laughs> well, I wrote that because a group of people in London asked me to address a, a conference that people were beginning to realize that certain aspects of artificial intelligence raised questions of what it means to be a human being. Because the idea is that, and very serious-minded thinkers are moving towards this, that we ought to change the specification of human beings, enhance them by biogenetic engineering, by drugs, maybe by incorporating technology and enhancing their bodies by some kind of cyborg implants and so on. What is a human being? And I first of all refused, and they insisted that they wanted me to talk about Genesis and what it says about the imago dei, the image of God. And in the end, I decided to do it. But once I started to do the research for it, I saw that this was so interesting. And out of it, in a few years, came this book, 2084. And of course, George Orwell wrote a book called 1984. And the idea is to try to present people, not only Christians, with the pluses and the minuses of artificial intelligence. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against AI. I, in fact, I use it all the time, and so do you probably, even if you don't realize it. So it's a book that thinks through the stuff that already is working, its pluses and its massive minuses, especially with surveillance technology being used to repress minorities in certain parts of the world. And then 
there's a second kind of AI, which is called artificial general intelligence, and that is the, has the objective of making a super intelligence, either by enhancing existing human beings or by starting from a non-organic base like silicon and building them up from scratch. And again, serious-minded people are predicting that a singularity will come, in the words of Ray Kurzweil, when the robots will take over. And that raises all kinds of questions in people's minds. What sort of robots? What, what is going to happen? And is all this hype? A lot of it is. And speculation. And what I wanted to do was to give a reasoned book with lots of sources saying what the current situation is and also illuminating it from biblical scenarios of the future. So that is 2084. John, I'm going to talk to you in a while about suffering, but, mm -hmm. uh, but the next book I'm holding is Where is God in the current Coronavirus World? Uh, what led you to write this? The pandemic. Uh, the first day of lockdown, on the Monday, I sat in my room in Oxford and I thought, we're going to be locked down for a long time. What can I do anything? We're going to be... And then I realized, and that was the mathematician in me, that this pandemic will scare people because it will multiply um, exponentially. So can I write anything? So I sat down on Monday. I wrote that little book. On Saturday evening, I rang a publisher. And Wednesday, the next week, it was in print. I don't think that's ever happened before, certainly not in his experience. And it's now in between 30 and 40 languages around the world. And it was just an attempt, really, not to solve the problem of suffering. It's the hardest problem, and you said you were going to ask me about it. It's the hardest problem any of us face, whether we're Christians or not. This is the hard problem, suffering and evil. And it would be arrogant of me and ridiculous, of course, to assume that I had the answer to it. But what I wanted to do in that little book is to show people that there is a way in that has brought real hope to millions of people through the years and particularly through centuries when there weren't even anesthetics. Can you imagine living in a world without anesthetics? So that was the motivation behind that. It's just an attempt to do something. And John, one of the things I love about your books is you often rewrite them. So you've revised <laughs> and updated that edition, haven't you? Oh, I did, yes. Yeah. Now, another topic that you've done in the past and now you've reissued as a new book, Can Science Explain Everything? Can you have a chat with us about that? <laughs> well, uh, that's simply to try to answer what is called scientism which is very dominant today, particularly because Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins have pushed it so powerfully that science can answer all of our questions. We don't need anything more than science. Now that is nonsense, actually, logical nonsense, because the statement science can explain everything is not a statement of science. It's a statement about science. It's a philosophical statement. But in this book, I go into the difference, and it's a very important difference. What do we mean by explaining something? Why is the kettle boiling? Well, because the heat energy from the gas flame is being conducted through the base of the kettle, agitating the water molecules, and it's boiling. Yes? But I could equally well say it's boiling because I, at this moment, if it's true, I want a cup of tea. Now, those are two separate explanations. One's a scientific one, and the other's a personal one. Do they contradict? No. Do they conflict? No. They complement each other. And the scientific analysis of that actually is the less important unless you're analyzing heat. For thousands of years, people have been enjoying a hot cup of tea without knowing anything about heat equations. Does that make sense to you? And I find school kids can see that. I say, which of those explanations is true? But sir, you need both, exactly. But why can't some professors see that? You see, God no more 
contradicts science than as an explanation for the universe, then Henry Ford contradicts automobile engineering and physics as an explanation for a motor car engine. They're complementary explanations. And what I try to do in that little book is to give arguments that anybody can understand and use, whether they're of a scientific background or not, to fight against this constant hammering on science will explain everything, follow the science, that's all you need to do. Well, it is when it comes to vaccines, but it may not be when you want to know the meaning of love. So it's very important that we realize science is wonderful, technology is very useful, but it's limited. It answers only a limited number of questions. And the famous Nobel Prize winner, Sir Peter Medawar, once put it this way. He said, you know, it's so easy to see that science is limited. It cannot answer the questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? And what is the meaning of life? Now, I've got in my hands a, a, a very different book, which I absolutely adored. It's called Against the Flow, The Inspiration of Daniel in an Age of Relativism. Would you please tell us what, what this book is about? Well, I love literature and I love biblical literature. And I had the great privilege as a boy already, but as a student and later, and for about 50 years of working with the late professor, David Gooding, who was a member of the Royal Irish Academy, which is the equivalent of the Royal Society, and was an expert on Greek and Latin and the language of the Bible. And he taught me the richness of biblical literature and story. Now, I'm Irish, and Irish people love stories. And I'm very interested in the way in which truth is communicated through story. And so, leaning on a lot of what he taught me through life, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is fascinating because it's a story of a young man and his three friends who were pulled out at the age of 15 or so from a monotheistic, tiny backwater culture in Judea, in Jerusalem, in the 6th century BC, and suddenly they found themselves in the most highly cultured, swinging city in the world, Babylon, and they were put into King's College, Babylon, to study in the university and became very high-powered administrators. And now Daniel reflects at the end of a long life how he managed, which is amazing, not only to maintain his faith in God and his devotion to God, many people do that, but he maintained his witness to God. He stood up publicly for God. And it occurred to me that there's so many things that we can learn from the things that he regards now at high old age is important as he analyzes his life's experience, and that's what that book is about. Well, John Lennox, I think we've made it quite plain that you are a man of faith in God. But I want to now ask you why uh, you will take the God that created the entire universe and link him to a carpenter's son born in some uh, Middle Eastern backwater 2,000 years ago. Would you please talk to me about why you believe in Jesus Christ? The central Christian claim is that the word that spoke the world into existence became human. That is a staggering claim. Absolutely staggering. And you only believe, as David Hume pointed out long ago, for staggering claims you need staggering evidence. And I believe that Jesus was both God and human because it's the only explanation that makes sense. Now, I can't explain exactly what that means. And it's important that I admit that. I was talking to 500 atomic physicists once and a chap came up afterwards. He was a professor at Oxford. And he said, now, he said, uh, that was a very interesting lecture, but I perceive that you're a Christian. He was quite sharp, this chap. <laughs> and um, he said, as a Christian, you're obliged to believe that Jesus was God and man. Is, is that right? I said, that's right. Well, he said, can you explain that? I said, well, 
Can I ask you a question first? I said, what is consciousness? And there was silence for a minute, and he said, I don't know. Okay, I said, let me try something easier. What is energy? Well, he said, we can measure it and we can use it. I said, you heard me, what is it? A longer silence, I don't know. I said, that's very interesting. Tell me, do you believe in consciousness? He said, I do. Do you believe in energy? Yes, I do. And you don't know what they are. Should I write you off as a physicist? He said, please don't. <laughs> but I said, you were about to write me off. When you asked me to explain something that is a huge mystery, how God can become human. Now, I said, let me push you a little bit. Why do you believe in consciousness and energy when you don't know what they are? Well, he said, you know, the concepts work and they make sense. I said, exactly. And that's exactly part of the reason I believe Jesus is both God and human because it's the only explanation of what I see in history, in the Gospels, and hugely importantly, in my own experience, it's the only thing that makes sense. And ladies and gentlemen, let me cut to the quick of this because this is a hugely important question. You're really asking me why I'm a Christian. And people in the audience were rightly say, well, the world is full of religions. Why, why, you know, why are you a Christian? Well, I'll tell you at least a little bit of it. I've studied as best I can. I have friends in most religions you name and none. And what I've discovered is this, that Christianity is not a religion in the normal sense. Let me unpack that just a little bit. When I ask people, and I always do, I don't presume that I know what they think religion is. They usually tell me, well, basic ideas, you've got Christianity, um, a religion is a way, it's a path, the eightfold path or whatever. And there's some kind of door at the beginning where you get in the ceremony or something like this. And usually the path, as you go along it, you're taught various rules and laws that you have to keep, and at the end you come to a judgment where your character, your deeds are assessed, and if they come up to scratch, you get into whatever it is, heaven, nirvana, etc., uh, etc., et and if not, then you're probably in trouble. Okay? And the whole principle is merit it's exactly like a university. You get in, you do your A-levels, and then you've got very kind professors. And, uh, but even they can't guarantee you a degree. Why? Because your degree depends on your own merit, doesn't it? And I meet many people who not only think religion is like that, they think Christianity is like that, and that's a fatal mistake. Because this is where Christianity differs from all merit-based religions or philosophies, because it is not merit-based. You see, one of the main reasons that I'm a Christian is because Christianity not only tells me facts about Jesus and all that he did, but why he did it. And at its heart is two big events, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And it raises the issue that I didn't answer earlier. He said, did I believe in sin? Well, you need to define it. Well, I don't even keep my own standards, and I can understand that, and I've made a mess of my own life, and I hope not so much a mess of the lives of others, but I've got to be realistic. I am a sinner in that sense. I don't even keep my own standards, let alone God's standards. So what's going to happen about that? So I struggle to keep the rules and regulations. And in my experience, people find that an awful slavery. And it's why many people, empty churches, mosques, uh, and all kinds of religious things, because they cannot keep up. And it's not real. It's like the beginning of the year. Uh, you make a resolution and it lasts about 30 milliseconds and it's gone. But the... I almost said the genius, it is the genius 
of the Christian message is that Christ meets me where I am as someone who's failed. And he said, I am prepared to forgive you right now. What? You don't mean I have to try until in the end I please you enough. No, I'll forgive you right now if you are prepared to face the fact that you have made a mess of your own life and other people's lives. And repent, that's what it means, to change your mind about that. And trust me, because I died for you. Now that might feel a bit like jargon to some of you, but come along with me for a moment. That is utterly radical and revolutionary. Because it means that Christ is giving something now, not on the basis of merit that we hope for at the end. Now, if you don't understand that, let me explain it to you in another context. On my second day at Cambridge, I met a beautiful young lady, one of four in the family, the eldest one. I've been married to her for 54 years. So that wasn't bad for day two. <laughs> so I thought, well, now you're a very pleasant young lady and I would like you to be my wife. So I bought her a lovely present. It was a cookbook. <laughs> and I, I said, now it's going to be like this. I'd like you to be my wife. So here are the rules for making apple cake. Thou shalt take so many <laughs> kilograms of sugar and so much flour and so much this and thou shalt mix them all together and thou shalt put them in an oven at 500 degrees centigrade and you'll make an apple cake. Now, it's going to be like this. If you keep these rules pretty well for the next, let's say, be reasonable, next 40 years, then I will accept you. Otherwise, go back to your mother. Why are you laughing? <laughs> That's what many people think of God, you know. Mm. It's exactly what they think. If I keep the rules, then you'll accept me. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be straight. You would not insult a fellow human being by treating them like that. I didn't give my wife any cookbook, not as a basis for marriage. I did give her plenty of cookbooks later. <laughs> <laughs> but her relationship with me does not depend on her merit at fulfilling what those rules say. The very fact that we accepted each other unconditionally is what sets someone free to enjoy cooking. If you thought your very life depended on it, and of all awful things, you might have to go back to your mother, <laughs> you wouldn't do it, would you? Now, I hope that conveys to you the radical nature of Christianity and what Christ offers. And that's the big thing for me. And you can test it, you see. People often say to me, in science you test things. In Christianity you can't test it. Of course you can. Christ says that if we trust him, he'll give us peace. I meet many people, senior business people, senior academics, people with all the toys and everything, but they've no deep peace. They've no real sense of acceptance and they're striving to get acceptance from their colleagues to make it, to prove themselves. Christ offers peace. He offers forgiveness. And we all need forgiveness. He offers new life and new power. Now you can test that. And the only way to test it is actually to take the step of trusting. And you see, because, and, and this we could go on for hours about the theology of the incarnation and God becoming human, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, if you'll forgive me, going back to the other metaphor. And I've experienced this in life so many times, in my family, and, and I often say, you know, I meet a student who's at the end, their wit's end, they've got no peace in life, their relationships are in a mess, they may be dependent on narcotics, and they feel like committing suicide. And then six months later, you meet them absolutely radiant, and you say, what has happened to you? And they may say, well, I met Christ, I became a Christian. They may say it in different ways, but you know it's real. And I've seen that too many times, not to be able to add one-on-one -on -one and get two. 
So there's the, if you like, Richard, the theoretical side, the fact that it makes sense of so many things. And I, I, I think of Christ as Lewis talks about God. I, I believe in God. I, I believe in the Son, not because I see it directly, because it's very dangerous to look directly at the Son, but because in its light I see everything else. And I find that the Christian message throws a huge light on everything in life. And I found that for, for the last nearly uh, 70 years. And increasingly, as my life draws towards its inevitable conclusion on this earth, the light gets brighter, not dimmer. So that would be my short answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> Glad it was a short one. Um, now, we've got you as a rational, highly educated man of science, so I want to put, put you up against some of the things that the Gospels actually say. So, how can you believe that Christ rose from the dead, as, as an example? The question of the biblical miracles. I, I don't believe all claims to miracles. We've got to retain a certain skepticism. Skeptic, by the way, is a lovely word. In Greek, skeptai means to check out from a distance. And that's what you need to do with everything. Check it out from a distance. But as a, a born skeptic, really, I treat such things as what is the evidence base. Now, one of the big issues with miracles like the biblical miracle, and I'm only going to talk about those. I'm not going to talk about weeping statues and all those kind of things that people claim. I'm going to talk about what set Christianity going and what has been at its heart for centuries, and that is the claim that Jesus has conquered death. He rose from the dead, or more accurately, God raised him from the dead. Now, if I meet some of my atheist opponents, they will tell me, like Hitchens did, uh, on one of my debates, I think it was the Edinburgh Festival, he said, but David Hume has dealt with that. Uh, you know, miracles are violations of the laws of nature, and from a scientific perspective, that's impossible. That's the crude version. But Hume was wrong. And interestingly, one of Hume's great intellectual defenders was the late Professor Anthony Flew of Reading, just up the road here. And I met Anthony... Um, towards the end of his life. And it's amazing, as a philosopher, he'd been the Richard Dawkins of his day, the number one atheist. And he said to me, you know, I was wrong about you. And all my books would have to be rewritten and I'm not going to get the chance to do it. I was deeply touched at that kind of humility, that intellectual humility was just amazing. And in high old age, he'd come to believe in God in some sense, why? Because of the word that is the human genome. That was the most interesting thing. He said the only explanation of this can be a God. But Hume said miracles are violations of the laws of nature. But are they? You see, the confusion there is understanding what a law of nature is. And the best and easiest illustration, and I put my little book on science, explain everything, is C.S. Lewis's. Suppose I'm staying in a hotel in Guildford tonight, which I'm not, but suppose I am, and I put 100 pounds in the drawer, and I put another 100 pounds in the drawer by my bed tomorrow night, so that's 200 pounds. And I wake up on the third morning, open the drawer, and there's 50 pounds in it. Now, what do I conclude? Do I conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of England? <laughs> well, you can see the point, can't you? I conclude that the laws of England have been broken. Why? Because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. I know that 100 plus 100 is 200. It was that yesterday, is that today. And that fact tells me that I made a fundamental mistake. I thought that my drawer and the room were a closed system of cause and effect. And they weren't. A thief was able to get in and put his hand in and take out 150 quid. Now, that's a very simple illustration, but it gets it across perfectly. The laws of nature are not like the laws of a country. 
if I drop an apple, it'll fall towards the center of the earth. That doesn't stop Richard reaching out and catching it. Something can come in from the outside. The laws are simply descriptions of what normally happens if there's no intervention. So science and the laws of nature have nothing to say about the resurrection of Christ except statistics can tell you that resurrections are very improbable. Of course. But the point is, once you remove the in-principle objection to miracle, which Lewis did completely a long time ago, you then have to ask, granted that science has nothing to say here, what has history got to say? Is there any evidence historically that Jesus rose from the dead? And there's a great deal of it, and it comes in two forms. There's the historical evidence, and there's then the experimental evidence that if Jesus is still alive, he can be encountered. And I've talked about that a few minutes, moments ago. But the historical evidence is, to my mind, utterly compelling. How did Christianity start? Out of a non-proselytizing Judaism. What was it that transformed the disciples? How will you explain the empty tomb, etc., etc.? And there's lots of stuff in a book that isn't there called Gunning for God, I've got two whole chapters at the end of it analyzing David Hume's arguments in great detail in order to get across these basic facts. So to sum up, I see nothing in science that speaks for and against. Science just can't adjudicate, but history and experience can. John, time's marching on, so I'm lunching questions as I'm looking at my list, and I've got two for you I'm going to add together. Why can't I just tick an intellectual box that says I believe in God, and that's enough? Well, you could tick any number of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> but God is not a proposition. God is a person. If you said that marriage consisted in ticking a box on a form in church, that would be a very impoverished view of marriage, wouldn't it? And... The idea of faith in God is not just belief that there is a God. The idea of faith in my wife is not just that I believe that she exists. Faith comes from the Latin fides, from which we get fidelity. It carries with it commitment and allegiance within a relationship. And faith in God is not simply faith that there is a God. That's a start, of course. That's a hugely important start. If I didn't believe my wife existed, then I don't think I'd be married to her. <laughs> she certainly wouldn't be married to me. But <laughs> you can see the difference between those two things. It's not simply intellectual assent to a set of propositions. If there is a God, and he's revealed himself in Christ, and that is why Christ is so important. He reveals God to me in terms that I can grapple with and understand. Why? Because I'm a human being. And God became one. That is a staggering thing. That's why, by the way, human beings are so important. Not only are they made in the image of God, but he so constituted them that he was able to become one. And therefore, I, I feel here that uh, we need to just realize that we're talking about a relationship. It's great to tick boxes and have a set of beliefs and facts, but this goes way beyond that. A set of belief in facts doesn't give you much meaning in life, but commitment and trust in friends and spouses and children and so on, and in God is the thing that brings meaning into life. And at my age, I see that many of the younger people I talk to, they're desperate for meaning and acceptance and all this kind of thing. That's where it comes. It's a relationship and a process, not just a set of facts. You're nearly 80 years old. Um, so you I'm told. So, can you talk to us practically about what your faith means to you daily? Well, it means that I have a constant 
source of strength, a person that I can talk to, and I do that every day I can with my wife in prayer, someone who directs my life and fills it with meaning, someone who speaks to me through scripture, and I expect that to happen because I not only believe God is real, I've experienced God is real. Uh, and that's hugely important. It's, it's as hard to define as if I were to just say to someone, well, what does your wife mean to you? If you say everything, that doesn't tell you very much. Mm. I mean, it says that you're a loving husband, but what are the details of that? And, and, and the important thing, I suppose, is when the chips are down, there's somewhere where you can go. It's not only when everything is wonderful and, and so on and so forth. But when you're facing hard questions, then I think God really does his stuff, if you'll forgive uh, a crude expression. Uh, and therefore, in life, I find it, it's a cumulative building up of experience that you learn to trust God more and more for bigger and bigger things that you wouldn't have trusted God for earlier. And you have a guide in life. And you can pray about your decisions. And often it's retrospective. You can see, well, God was in that. So you describe that as a living relationship? Absolutely. Well, relationships usually are living. That's, uh, <laughs> that's by definition, a relationship is a living process. Well, here's the question that comes with that. Why not simply say that seeking to live a good life is enough? Well... Because if that were true, that would be fine. But where's the evidence that it's enough? If there is a God who's created us and has told us the source of fulfillment and of meaning, has told us what's wrong with us and how it can be put right, to say, well, live a good life, but what is a good life? I mean, I've been into that earlier when I talked about this religious idea that we try to be good and we get ourselves in knots and feel utter failures often and give up all kinds of religion because we cannot do that. So all of those things uh, tell me that that is not a way to go because it just simply doesn't work. And it flies in the face of the truth of what is revealed to me. I want to know what's true. You see... I could feel that that's okay. Just as if I saw you lying on the beach down the south coast and I'm watching from the cliff and you're enjoying it, that's wonderful, you're having a terrific life, but I see that the sea has encircled you completely. Now, what am I going to do? Will I come down and say, Richard, it's fine, you know, it's great, you're enjoying life, just seek to care, and, and you're in mortal danger. And I think that's the position that we are in. We need to be told the truth. And Always, as a child, I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know why my parents believed what I believed. I saw it was credible first, but I had lots of questions. And bless them, they encouraged those questions. They encouraged me to be critical. Well, now here's a question that I know you get asked a lot, and I'm sorry it's late that it's coming up, but our world is beset with wars, pandemics, earthquakes, etc. How can a God of love allow suffering. How can you, can you give us a short answer to that, please? Well, that's in a sense an impossible challenge because there are two kinds of people in this room. There are some of us that watch suffering. For example, in Ukraine. There are some of us who've been through it and that's very different. The viewpoint of an oncologist is different from the young mother of 30 who's just been told she's terminal pancreatic cancer. So this question has got two sides. It's got a pastoral side and it's got an intellectual side. And it's usually those of us who are watching suffering that are the big questions. Intellectual ones, the people that are actually suffering they have deep existential questions and we need to address both. And I've tried to do that in that little book. Now, on the intellectual side, very briefly, 
I have many friends, whose, all of whose relatives perished in the Holocaust. And I've been in Auschwitz many times, and I wept every time. And you see that. Now, that's moral evil. That is to be distinguished from what we curiously call natural evil, tsunamis, pandemics, earthquakes. There are two kinds. There's the kind for which human beings are responsible. That's the moral kind. There then is the fracture in creation. I like to think of two fractures. There's a fracture in human um, behavior, and there's a fracture in the behavior of nature. And they are, in a sense, different, although one can lead to the other uh, and vice versa. Atheism, my atheist friends tell me that they've solved the problem. This is just simply the brute fact of how it is. Get used to it. Well, they think, and I understand them, and I understand why they go that way. They think they've solved the problem, but they haven't removed the suffering. What they have removed, by definition, is all possibility of hope. Because the vast majority of people in the world will die without alleviation of their suffering. And because death is the end, there's no hope. Atheism, in that sense, is a hopeless philosophy. Now, it may be true, but I like to point out that there are big negatives there. Now, I have the problem because I still believe in God. And I'll have to cut because it is getting late, and at my age you get very tired. Um, I have a problem because I'm a Christian and do believe in God and still believe in God, even though there is suffering in the world. And as I say, I wouldn't want to insult anybody by trying to come across with some sort of trivial, banal answer to it. But what I would say is this. At the heart of the Christian message stands a cross. And the claim is that the person on the cross is God incarnate. Now, if that's true, then it means that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has become part of it. Now, that's a big step forward. Now, the way you formulated the question, Richard, is that the way in which Epicurus put it centuries ago, and David Hume put it, and all sorts of people put it, how can a good God and an all-powerful God allow this kind of thing? Either he's not good or he's not powerful. End of story. I think it's much more complex than that. But what I do know is when the question is formulated in that way, I've never heard a satisfactory answer to it of you. I used to argue this with my fellow students and long after I was a student, and we never got anywhere. Now, as a mathematician, I've learned uh, just a little bit in life that when you get nowhere with a question, you'd be wise to change the question. So I have formulated another question, which is equally difficult, but brings us a bit further, and it's this. Any religion or philosophy that is remotely credible has to face the fact that we're facing in the most acute way possible today, but all through history, a mixed picture. I call it beauty and bombs. I look through my telescope, I see Andromeda galaxies, absolutely spectacular beauty in the universe, or the flowers and the trees and the birds and the mountains, and the sea. And then I look at the television and see a cruise missile hitting a supermarket in Ukraine. Beauty and bombs. It's got to be accepted. Now, granted that that's so, we're accepting it now, that that's a mixed picture. And people will argue about this. How is it there's so much beauty and so much evil? What is this universe telling us? Here's my question. Granted that it is so, is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God whom we could trust with it? That's a hard question. And I feel there is. I think there is. I think there's evidence that there is. 
Because one of the other things that we haven't mentioned about Christianity is the implication of the resurrection of Jesus is that death is not the end and he has conquered it. That makes everything visible in a completely new light. It doesn't take away the pain and the suffering. But it does bring real hope. And the question is, do I have sufficient confidence in Christ who's going to judge the whole world that he'll be able to sort it out? And I confess I do. You may think I'm a fool for doing so. But I believe there's enough evidence for it. And what is more, I've seen so many people. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake some years ago, you'll remember it. And I talked about this at one of the biggest church services at a Baptist church like this just on the Sunday after the earthquake. And I mentioned this and there was a note left for me by a woman who didn't want to say she stay. She just lost her husband. And on the little note it said, this is the first ray of hope I see. Well, it's a ray of hope. It doesn't mean we've got the answer. And I sit here and you ask me a question about suffering. What do I know about suffering? I don't like dentists. <laughs> you know, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those that don't like dentists and liars. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean about pain. We don't like pain. But you see, I nearly died. Let me be personal. Can I tell a personal story? I nearly died in 2014, I think it was. And suddenly it was realized, I, one of my coronary arteries had completely blocked and they, all I remember is a doctor saying we're losing him and they raced along in the hospital and threw me the operating table. But at the door of the operation room, I had to say goodbye to my wife. I hadn't done that before. And you know, in those moments, both she and I had perfect peace. Can I explain that to you? No, except that I believe that God does his stuff in this situation. I didn't know whether I'd see her again. The doctors thought I was going to have a massive heart attack that would have wiped me completely out. And in fact, when the surgeon operated, he said, I don't know what to say to you because you should be dead. All medical reasons where you should be dead your heart's not damaged, you can go home tomorrow. And that experience taught me something that I hope I've learned from it. It taught me that I was mortal, certainly. But I realized there's, there's a something very deep here that the relationship with Christ in the situation. I'll tell you one more story. I've been in Siberia many times and I'll never forget meeting the first Russian who'd been sentenced to seven years in Gulag because he taught children the Bible. He was a tiny little man. I towered above him. And he told me about this. And he said, I saw things that never a man should see in the prison. And then he looked at me and with a great wide smile, he said, you couldn't face that, could you? And I tell you, I just felt tiny. I just crumpled. And I stuttered out and I said, no, I couldn't. I, I couldn't face that. And he said this. He said, neither could I. He said, you know, I used to faint when I cut myself shaving. And I saw sights of cruelty in the gulag that no man should ever have to see. But he said, you know what I discovered? In the situation, God met me. And he said, God doesn't give theoretical help for people before the situation. He will meet them in their suffering, in the situation. That's only the beginning of an answer. A, a bit more you can read in my little book. John, we are coming to the yeah. end. Um, we're in an age of personal freedom. We, we, we constantly talk about our personal freedoms. And often I hear people say to me, well, won't Christianity take away my freedom? Well, don't I lose out in this life if I become a Christian? What's your answer to that? Well, I would first reflect on playing the piano. In order to be free to play Beethoven, you must be very disciplined. 
and follow the notes in his score. And it's like that in life. What is freedom? Free to do what? And, and the wonderful thing is that I find Christianity, and I always did in my parents, to be open-ended, liberating, because it allowed me to think. In science, it doesn't restrict me to materialistic causes. It opens up much more than the dominant academic worldview gives me. And the idea that God is out to spoil your fun, he's watching people, and he's, as Christopher Hitchens said directly to me, and you can see my answer to him on one of the DVDs, God is like a North Korean dictator in the sky, always looking to see if you're having fun and spoiling it. That's nonsense. I think the point is this. This man here, as many of you know, is a petrol head. Do you know what that is? And there are others in the audience that share his passion. And so we get a, a new Porsche. And we don't bother reading the manual. I want to be free to drive this car as I like, and it's one of the older ones with the manual gears changed. So you put it out of fifth gear into reverse when you're doing 150 miles an hour. Do you know what's going to happen? You're going to wreck it. Oh, but I'm free. Ah, but you see, the manufacturer wrote a handbook so that you could enjoy the freedom of driving it as it should be driven. <laughs> And I have a handbook. It's called the Bible. And it was written by someone who loves me, who created me, and wants me to have that sense of freedom and meaning that I can really live. Because he knows how I tick. And what he says to me is said not to crush me, but to allow me to develop and flourish as a human being. And there's no flourishing in any profession in any area of life without some discipline, is there? But that's another big story. Now, John, if I found all this very interesting, what do you suggest I should be doing to look into Christianity more fully? Well, I have said that my basic source is the Bible. And I find that, amazingly, many people have never read it as adults or never looked at it. And I'm delighted that Richard and I, uh, Richard is doing this interview because he and I have known each other for a long time and have seen together the importance of actually helping people to get over that initial feeling of, why should I bother reading the Bible? It's boring after all, and nobody can understand it, and there's so many different interpretations. And the interesting thing is this, that my interviewer here, you may not know this, has spent a lot of time really exploring how to do that, particularly but not only with people in the city, people he knows through his work and so on, is getting them through that barrier. And he's written a series of books, there's some back there I noticed, called The Word One to One. So Richard, you've asked the wrong person. I ought to ask you how people should start doing it. Well, you know full well that you and I, through some dinners in London with some executives, came up with looking at what is a unique first passage at the start of one gospel, one of the four books that explains Jesus' life. And it's unique because in 18 sentences, it's the only executive summary or overview that exists in the whole book. And people often say to me, um, well, you know, I would be interested in reading the Bible one day, but I wouldn't know where to start. Well, what we've come up with is this thing that's on the screen, which is called Word One to One, which takes a few sentences at a time, raises on the right-hand side of the, of the page a question and then answer that that sentence raises. So what we would like to suggest tonight is if you have found this interesting, there are cards at the back as you go out for you to take home that offers you the chance to have a cup of coffee with one of us to just look at the first 18 sentences of one book of the Bible. It's the book of John. It's unique. It is this executive summary, this overview. All that we will say to you at the end of your coffee is, did you enjoy that and would you like to see what happens next? 
Now, we have laid out the whole book of John in this format. So if you would like to see what happens next, the format is very open and honest to be able to go through. It's non-threatening. You're never put in a position that you don't know the answer. It is an open conversation to look at one book of the Bible. And we do hope you've found this interesting. And I'm sure you would like me to thank John on your behalf. Before we say goodbye, John, I've got one last question. I dreaded that. You knew I was going to ask you. Let's just say this is your last audience. What is it that you would passionately want to say to us as you close tonight? Two things. One, do what he says. The second thing is, and it's related to that, don't reject Christianity before you've listened to what it says. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you, John. Well, as I said, there is a book table to look at at the back, and please make sure that you grab a card. We'd love to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much for coming.